thing Cornelius as uh, he comes into his house and into his home. So let's backtrack now to verses 24 and 26 of Acts chapter 10. The Bible says this, But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Um, verse 24. And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, they had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Okay? And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also but a man. Now, I want you to note something. Remember, here we have a parallel story going on. The Lord is speaking to Peter while he's at Simon Peter or, or Simon's home, Simon the Tanner, and he's telling him three guys are going to come see you. He's telling him exactly what to do. He's telling him the message and that there's going to be three people coming and you are to go with them. Remember, on the other side of the scene over here is Cornelius, and Cornelius gets a vision by an angel that says, "Go send for a man named Peter. He's staying at." Simon the Tanner's house, which is by the seaside. He's over there in Joppa. Pretty specific, isn't he? I mean, God does things so clearly in this that you know that it was God who did it. And there's no denying it. It was at the same time, the same time frame. This is really, really neat and really interesting. You know it was a God-ordained moment for these people to come together. That often happens in our lives. You see, sometimes we want it now. But what we don't realize is God's doing something else on the other side that you just, you just can't see right now. But He's preparing hearts and He's preparing people so that whenever there comes a time, we're going to mesh and we're going to have that encounter. This is what's going to happen. So here we have this centurion who is an authoritative figure who sends three people to go retrieve him. Now... It's pretty amazing because for a Jew just to even respond to that, which what the Roman citizen was doing, we, we know of that whenever a Roman would encounter a Jew, that they were to carry their luggage and carry their stuff a mile. You always heard, go the extra mile. Well, a Jew would always teach their children just exactly how far that mile would be, and they would drop their stuff. But Jesus and those, they taught, go the extra mile. You gave one mile because they asked you to. You do the other mile because you are doing it as a witness and a testimony of the graciousness of God. Here, this Roman citizen, he sent for the Jews. But what's really neat is these, the, this Cornelius says he sent these three men to get him. This is, he's sending him after some pious Jew who really could have just blew him off and said, I don't owe him and I don't know him and I don't owe him anything. I don't have time for this. I've got ministry work to do here. I've got Jewish brothers and sisters who need to hear the gospel. I don't have time to go over here and witness to this Cornelius cat because he's, uh, he's, he, I've got too much stuff going on. But God spoke to him and told him, I want you to go. So here, what's really impressive is, is that he went, and when he gets there, Cornelius is waiting on him. Wouldn't you think that, you know what, if God wants me to speak to this Cornelius guy, why don't he come to himself? You know, often we could use all those same excuses. Cornelius had going on what he had going on, and he did what God told him to do. He said, send for him, not go to him. He said, send for him. This is so important. If Cornelius went, this second action, which we're going to read here in a moment, would not have happened in the home and in the household of Cornelius. He asked him to come into his home and into his household. What a beautiful picture here. Cornelius... When he met him, he shows him extreme reverence and comes up to Peter and falls down at his feet to worship him, as it said in verse 25. Now, Cornelius didn't know Peter, but they must have thought that he's some kind of special man from God, that he felt that the need to, to bow at his feet and to worship him. Now, this reaction... It's understandable to show respect. I mean, even in cultures today, you could walk up and you could bow to someone. You know, you could. Uh, we show reverence, we show respect, and so forth. It, it, it wasn't that it was. Um, it's understandable, but it was wrong. And I want to show you something that, in reading and in studying about this over the past several weeks, that I've come to understand. You see, 
Peter corrected Cornelius. Now he was a man of Roman authority, authority, and he corrects him, and he says this to Cornelius. He says, stand up, because I am also a man just like you. I put my pants on just like you put your pants on. One leg at a time. I'm no different. I'm no better. I'm no worse. Wow. Now we read that today, and we really don't think a whole lot about that. But you've got to understand the mindset, especially in the culture and in the day and time of this, for a Jew to bring his piety and his piousness down to the level of a Gentile, that's unheard of. You know, everybody wants to be puffed up. Everybody likes to be up on the ladder. Everybody likes that, especially in the culture of that, of the Jewish culture, to humble themselves to that of the equality of a Gentile? Unheard of. You don't do that. This is just unheard of. And whenever he says, I myself am also a man. Now Cornelius, he should not have given such reverence to Peter, but also neither should have Peter took it and just said, bow to me. You know, he could have sang that old Aretha Franklin song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me, respect. And, and, and you know, he didn't do that. There is a mutual respect that is going on here. Don't miss this. It is so important in chapter 10 that you see this correlation of Peter having respect unto Cornelius and in turn what you will find is Cornelius having respect unto Peter. A friendship, a kindred. You've got to make that connection here within this. So Peter and Cornelius, they honored each other and Peter honored Cornelius back and forth because here it is, he come all the way from Joppa to meet him, to see him. So let's look on at verses 27 and 29. Verse 27 says, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto uh, one of another nation, but, man, you can circle that right there, but, again saying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, for what intent you have sent for me? Wow. Now we just read over that. We don't really think about what just was said. But you've got to understand a couple of things. Remember how I talked to you about last week that one Peter, he was staying in one Simon the Tanner's house? No, no. That's a no, no. You don't do that. A Tanner is an unclean person. They were cast out of the city. They had to be at least 75 feet away. They were looked down upon. If somebody was engaged to a Tanner and found out about it later, they could have that wedding annulled. I mean, this... Peter, what are you doing? You're going down a path. You're a good Jewish boy. I realize that you've gotten caught up on this whole Jesus thing, but you're a Jew, and you're not following Jewish custom. Why are you staying out there? Why are you going down that path? So we see that, and we see them going down the wrong path here, and now we see what Peter does next. He goes, uh, well, then when he's staying at Simon Tanner's house, then these three individuals come to him. They're Gentile. You remember what he did? He invited them into the house of Simon the Tanners. One, you don't show that respect to a Gentile. You just don't do that. You invited them into the company of your own home and lodged there and left out. Wow, this is big. Now, note what I said. Peter here in verse uh, in verse 27, and as he talked with him, they, you know, remember Cornelius is out there, he's greeting them, and he go and he went. In and found many that were come together. Peter, a Jew, goes into a Gentile's home. This would be a very unclean thing to do. You don't go in a Gentile's home. They're unclean. They eat things that are unclean. Their kitchen is not going to be clean. You know, I always like to, you know, you always want to judge a restaurant by looking how clean the bathrooms are and how the kitchen is. I don't know about you, but uh, I mean, you always want to look and kind of like to look back there in the kitchen area. And believe me, there's a lot of times you really don't want to look back there in the kitchen area, okay? If you did, you probably wouldn't order anything at all. 
You'd be like, they're unclean, unclean. I'm not eating here. They viewed them as you eat unclean foods on this. Do you understand the dynamics between Jew and Gentile? I don't think so, and I didn't fully understand it all either. Because here, encountering Cornelius' house, there were so many Jewish customs and Jewish traditions, things you just don't do that they got caught up in. Their heart and mind, it, it had changed. He said unto them, Peter felt the need to explain why he's a godly Jew. He said, I'm a God-fearing, godly Jew. For me to do this, I would never do what I'm doing. I would never cross the line of tradition. I've never had any unclean food come into my mouth. I don't eat unclean. I don't try to think unclean. I, I try to be a good Jew. But God told me to come here. And if God told me to do it, I'm going to do it. It may not make sense to the rest of the world. Nobody else may understand it. It may caught up in tradition. But I'm going to do what God's told me to do and let God be true and every man a liar. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. If God tells you to do it, you better do it. What he called clean, don't call unclean. Jesus said in, in, in Mark 7, 18, he said, And he has said unto them, Are ye also without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile the man? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. Listen, you're not going to go to hell because you ate something bad. That's not it. But you could go to hell because you did not accept Jesus Christ into your heart. And God is more concerned about your heart than what you're putting into your belly. Okay? Paul also knew this practice in Colossians 2, 16, 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or in a new moon or in the Sabbath days, which are shadow of things to come, but is in the body of Christ. He says, therefore, I came unto you because I am a Jew and God gave me this message. <coughs> Cornelius, can you explain to me why you had me come in. Cornelius says in verses 32-33, I'm glad you asked. And Cornelius said, verse 30, four days ago, I was fasting. Now here we are. We're seeing a comparison here. Fasting is this, is uh, you can fast different things, but if you really want to do a hardcore study on fasting, it means to abstain from food at a time frame when you would normally be eating. And he was fasting about 3 o'clock. And he said that I was fasting, I was abstaining from food. Fasting is a Jewish custom and a Jewish practice. This man's a Gentile doing Jewish traditions. Fasting, abstaining from food. Now that doesn't mean that you went on a diet. Hear me clearly. It's not meaning that he's on a diet, but at the time frame when you would normally eat, you say, I'm going to spend and utilize this time frame in prayer and supplication with God as opposed to satisfying the flesh. So, he was fasting until this hour. And in the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock, okay, and I can get into a whole calendar time frame with you. I probably should be. We just wrote the hours back. But you have watches at night. Watches are at night from midnight to 3 a.m. is the first watch, 3 a.m. To, uh, to 6. No, wait a minute, I'm sorry. It's 6. 6 to 9 is the first watch. Six. Let me just slow it down here. At night time, for us, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the first watch. That's a quarter of the clock. From 9 to midnight is the second watch. From midnight to 3 a.m. is the third watch. And then from 3 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, AM is the fourth watch. So when you see a watch, it's clearly defining that's nighttime. When you see it was at this hour of the day, then the clock starts over. So six, seven, eight, nine, you know, at, at 3 AM, that's the ninth hour. So always just understand that when you're reading in the Bible, watches are at night, hours are for day. Okay? A little tip in there. So here he says, he says, I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and he said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. We can get in a long debate. Does God hear the prayers of an unsaved individual? Obviously, 
His prayers are heard. <clears throat> Moving on. His prayer is heard in thy alms. You're a good guy, Cornelius. I see your good deeds. I see your work, good works and remembrance in the sight of God. He said, Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, he didn't hesitate. He didn't wait. We saw Peter. He had questioned God about three times about this. But here the Gentile, immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done, and thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here? You might want to underline that. We're all here, present before God, to hear all things that are commanded of thee. Man alive. You talk about a preacher's dream. I mean, you talk about a preacher's dream. He shows up. He's entered into the house. There's a courtyard. I don't know how many are there. I don't know if it's 10, 20, 50, but I'd say Cornelius has said there's a special guy coming today. I'd say that courtyard was filled up with friends, neighbors, relatives, people Cornelius wanted to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ or the gospel. And they're all there in this courtyard. And Peter has an opportunity to preach a message. I'd love to preach a message like that. It'd be a preacher's dream. You want to hear what? You want to hear about my Jesus? Let me tell you about my Jesus. And you know, I don't read in here, and I'm going to have to skim for time's sake here, but I don't see where Peter just preached a different kind of message just because it was a different kind of people. I want to make it very clear. The same gospel that Peter preached at the day of Pentecost is the same gospel message that he preached here before the Gentiles. The message does not change just because the people group changed. You have to think differently how to get to them and how to reach them. But the gospel message is indeed the gospel message. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's good for you, and it's good for the Jew, and it's good for me. It's good for anyone who would be willing to hear the good news. And here he has that awesome opportunity to proclaim the message. So he tells how he got here. He tells how he got here. Wow. Moving on. This is so Exciting! He's living the preacher's dream. Peter's short sermon to the Gentiles is this. i got so much I want to share. I've got seven pages of notes and I'm on page three, so I'm going to move on. Peter just preached the sermon. Jesus. I think Jesus is enough. I think his gospel is enough. He goes on to tell him... This is the one. Now, I am going to hit on some points here because the same God that died for me is the same God that died for you. The same God that died for me here in America is the same God that died for those over in Haiti. The same God that gave His life for whosoever will accept the good news of Jesus Christ shall be saved. You say, whoa, wait a minute. That couldn't be for women. It's for women as well as it is for men. Can I hear an amen to that? Oh, wait a minute. It can't be for that color. I'm sorry. My God sees the heart of the interior, not the pigmentation of the exterior. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. I was weak, guys. Everybody needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody needs to hear this. My God and your God, he died for all. Gentile, Jew, everyone alike. And we see this giving us this awesome opportunity and things. And I could get into all this of the hatred that goes on and the defaming of that of Gentile custom and Jewish custom. Maybe I need to. Maybe I just need to backtrack. William Barclay, I'll tell you where I got the information there. William Barclay said this. Even at a Jewish prayer time, he would thank God every morning that he wasn't a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Hey, I'm just repeating to you how they would pray. A slave? Thank God I'm not a slave. Thank God I'm not a Gentile. Thank God I'm not a I'm like, what the world? As a basic Jewish religion in the days of New Testament, it was an oath that you would never help a Gentile. I'm not going to help a Gentile. Even if a woman, a Gentile woman, was in pain and travail and was fixing to give birth, they wouldn't help it. Kind of makes sense how they just walked on by the, the, um, the abused, beaten one that was there on the, on, the, on the Samaritan, the good Samaritan here. They just... Basically this, if a Jew married a Gentile, the Jewish community would have a funeral for the Jew and just consider him dead. 
they would write him off because they married outside of the Jewish customs. It was thought that even and to enter into a Gentile's house made them unclean. It was, but I'm going to tell you what, Gentiles was just equally as bad. They looked down upon the Jews equally. I mean, they were not G and Ha here. They were not on, in cahoots. Gentiles despised the Jews. They thought they were evil plotters. They thought they, they loved pigs because they didn't eat them. I mean, there was all kinds of things here within this. So I'm going to move on for time's sake. But there was a lot of animosity between them. And you've got to put animosity aside. And you've got to gain respect for one another and move past that. Verse 35 talks about, but in, listen to this. This is so important. I want you to know God loves everybody. Verse 35, but in every, well, let me back up verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He loves you just as much as he does anyone else. And you are no better than anyone else. You're neither higher nor lower. We're all, it's, I'm going to just say this. It's a level playing field at the foot of the cross. Amen. Amen. It's a level playing field at the foot of the cross. Man, this is good stuff. But in every nation... In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word of God, which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. He is Lord of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every creed, every color. It doesn't matter. God is our creator and he is over all things. And that had been revealed unto Peter in a way that he could preach it excitingly and fervently and, and with all, I mean, just so, such excitement. Verse 37, the word I say unto ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, which is the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. Guys, this is the sermon that Peter's bringing. Stay with me, guys. I know my time is coming, but i got to keep moving on this. This is good, and I wouldn't hold you if I didn't think this was some good meat that I want to share with you tonight. This is worth coming to church for. I want you to hear this. I, I really do. Here, Peter is bringing the same gospel message that he did that at, at, at Pentecost as he does right here. He tells them, this same Jesus, which you and I, we hung on a tree. How can you say this? You see, Hitler, not too long ago, he blamed the Jews for killing them. And he pointed out the Jews to be the bad guys. And the Jews would say, no, it was the Gentiles, it was the Romans who did this. Do you realize that whenever Jesus Christ was tried before uh, before his hanging up upon the cross that he had six trials. Six unjust, unfathomable trials. Three of those was before Jews and the Jewish Sanhedrins and so forth. And the Jews tried to find him guilty and yet they could not kill him, but they wanted to have him killed. And all three of them tried to find him guilty. The other three trials was before Gentile and Roman custom and Pontius Pilate and all these other folks. Folks, three and three here. Don't blame one group over the other group. For no man took his life. Jesus Christ was willing to lay it down freely for all. Amen? Amen. Jew and Gentile. Across the board, guys. He doesn't just see color. He sees the heart. He doesn't just see your economic status. He sees the heart. He doesn't just see your nationality. He sees your heart. And the gospel should be preached unto Judea, Jer Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. He is Lord of all. And seeing these six trials. And I want you to see this. Keep going, guys. This is good. Verse 40 says, Him... God raised up on the third day. And man, I'm telling you what, I don't serve a dead God. I serve an alive God. I serve a risen Savior who, yes, came to this earth, died, crucified, buried, risen again, and he rose again on the third day, and they showed him openly. Let me tell you something about him. Not to all people. He didn't reveal himself to all people then, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink. Man, here we go, eating and drinking with him again. With him after he rose from the dead. He says, I saw him. I saw the nail-scarred hands. I saw the pierced side. He is alive. 
And I'm here to tell you the good news that he didn't just die for me. He died for you. And it is such good news. Whosoever will. Whosoever will believe in him. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remissions of sins. Folks, the gospel and the good news is available to all. Whosoever will. And unfortunately there's a false doctrine that goes around out there that only a select few can be saved. My friends, whosoever will. Man, woman, child, it doesn't matter. God is available to the whosoever. You say, I'm not so sure about that. Paul got it. Paul got it whenever he wrote the book of Galatians. Galatians 3, 23, 29 says this. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. You see, it's not just by being a Jew, being kept under the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Hear this in verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmasters. Listen, I'm no longer bound by the Old Testament. I wasn't a Jew. I'm not a Jew. You're not a Jew. Anybody here a Jew? I don't believe so. We're not bound by the Jewish laws and the Jewish customs and things. Well, we recognize that the schoolmaster, he didn't come to condemn the law. He came to fulfill the law. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Listen to this, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond or slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are adopted into the kingdom of God. And it's a beautiful thing. Look at the results of Peter preaching here to Cornelius. Man! Acts 44 through 48. These God-fearing Gentiles, they were hungry. And I'm going to tell you what they had right here. They had a prepared preacher. Peter was ready to preach the word of God. I can only imagine walking with these three guys. Here also come some other uh, Jews that was along with him, you know, that was staying at Simon the Tanner's house. They're kind of following along. They want to see what's going to happen here. And it's as a testimony of what's going to happen. And as they're coming along, they're entering in. And here we see the results is, is that we have a prepared preacher, but we also have a prepared congregation. And the congregation was ready to hear the word of God. My grandpa told me one time that he had the awesome opportunity to go and to preach into a uh, different ethnic church. There's only one race. It's the human race. But he went into this church and he said he was a preacher and he had some folks go with him when he went to preach. And when he went to that church, man, they were hollering, Amen. He, had, he said there was one fellow in there. He wouldn't say Amen. He'd say, Well, well, he keep preaching. He said, well, can I hear a well? Anybody got a well? Yeah. Well. Steve, you're going to start on the well. He said, well, well. And he just kept going. I mean, everybody in the whole church, they just kept preaching. And he said, the more that he preached, the more they'd say, hey, man, well, come on, preach, girl. Well. And I mean, whenever he got back, he got back to his home church. They said, Brother John, we've never heard you preach like that before. And he said this to them, I've never heard amens like that before. I want you to understand our worship experience is twofold. I'm going to do my best. I promise you. I'm not the best, but I'll give you my best. I'm not the most vocabulary. I slip. I make mistakes. And I'm humbled anybody to listen to me. And the only reason why you listen to me is because you know I love you. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to study. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to come. If I don't have it, I'm going to call on somebody else who can. I make a commitment before God. I'm going to do my very, very best to bring the message to prepare. But I'm also going to challenge you. You do your best and be prepared to listen to it. Well, that's true. Amen. You be ready to hear it. You want a good church service? You be ready to receive a good church service. 
You want to hear some man? That was a great message today. Why? Because I was prepared for a great message today. I want to hear it. It starts within me. Don't blame the preacher, the, the heat, the air, the cold, the, the, the where. I just want to hear from God today. That's it. And these people, I'm going to tell you what, whenever you have these two mesh, whenever you have the Word of God prepared by the preacher of God, and whenever you have the reception and you're ready to receive it, it's amazing what can happen. Let me tell you what happened. Pentecost broke out all over again. Here, and I'm going to just have to, I'm going to, just have to hit it for this purpose sake. Pentecost broke out again. And you said, what? Just like it did in Acts chapter 2 when they were in the upper room. Remember, God told them, I want you to go, you gather, you get in this upper room. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. There were Jews. There's about 300 up there in the room. Like cloven tongues of fire. And they spoke in the utterance of tongues. And I mean, outside they were like, are they, are they drunk? No, they were not drunk. They heard them speaking in their own languages and so forth. Now, I can get into tongues and I can talk about that a whole lot because there are three rules that whenever you hear tongues, and I do believe in it, I've seen it, I've heard it, and you can say, what? I do believe that there is an interpretations and things thereof. But Paul himself said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of the tongues of angels. Here we see that they were crying out, speaking into, I believe that what we witness here is a, a mirror image of what happened within the Jewish on Acts chapter 2. Same thing happened amongst the Gentiles. God is no respecter of persons. And for those Jews that came and was able to witness this that was going on, they were in awe. Because hear me on this. I've I, I got to get this message across. You all have been awesome, and I thank you all for listening. But do you understand to become a Christian? Prior to this and everything that I've read, they try to put stipulations on you to become Christians. In church, we can easily try to do that too, and we can do it in a lot of our rituals and a lot of our routines. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. You say, wait a minute, you want to become Christian? Well, you've got to become Jewish first. We're going to read on in this. Gentlemen, you want to become Christian? Oh, we've got to go through our old custom and old laws. You've got to be circumcised, guys, if you really want to be a Christian. It's not what it says. Don't try to fit Old Testament Jewish customs and laws into the grace that has been offered unto us today. You've got to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. Absolutely not. Christian and Jew alike. We both come to Jesus Christ the same way and it's by faith in God. And then we exercise our practices. Well guys, our time has come and I want you to see here this great and awesome thing that takes place. You know what happens? You have the preaching of the Word of God. You have the reception of the congregation that's ready to hear the Word of God. The Holy Spirit falls and comes upon them. A great, mighty move of God. Guess what's going to happen next? <laughs> Splish, splash, we're in the baptismal pools of water. And He's going to baptize them. Recognizing and symbolizing the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, it's a beautiful thing. And I love this right here. Verse 47. Musicians, if you would, would you come? I believe we've got a song in mind. Can any man forbid water? Well, wait a minute. They're not Jewish. Oh, wait a minute. They're not a male. Well, wait a minute. They don't look like us. Wait a minute. They're unclean. I can't get in that water after he got in that water. I can't jump in there after that. No, listen. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? The same God that saved you is the same God that can save them. Amen. And folks, if God has been so gracious to look beyond our faults and see our needs, shouldn't we also walk out of here tonight and be able to proclaim the same gospel? The same gospel. The gospel has not changed. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we ought to be able to take it out these doors as well. Isn't this worth coming to church for tonight? Amen. Guys, would you stand with me all over the church house? We're going to have a hymn of invitation.